Well, thanks for staying around, and I'm uh, glad a few of you are interested in uh, spraying because it makes up certainly a big part of our, uh, our business and your business too, no doubt. And it's also impacting on the com community and its perceptions of agriculture. And so I think it's a quite an important topic. And obviously the conference over the last two days has had a focus on, uh, on spraying and the new regulations that are out there. World's best um, practice in spray application is all about how we manage that little uh, spray droplet we produce when we go spraying. And it's also about how we handle the product when it's in the, when it's in the drum and we go and mix it. So whether we, uh, we, don't, we don't want to contaminate the soil or the, or the water. And there's a lot of things around the world um, that are in place now, especially in Europe, which, um, which are in place to try and prevent some of that contamination from happening. It all sounds pretty simple when we've, we've just got to manage a little droplet. But there's quite a bit of variation. There's not too many rights and wrongs. And there's a lot of variation, there's a lot of complexity. We've got different targets, we've got different weather conditions, and there's different products, there's different adjuvants. So there's plenty of different complexities within the whole spray application process. So it's more so about our willingness to learn and understand and uh, apply, those, uh, apply that knowledge to make each job work effectively. Because at the end of the day, it's about that small droplet getting to the target and then being retained by the target and then being taken up by the plant. So I hope to cover a few of these issues and show a few photos to keep you awake in this last session. I've had an amazing 12 months as an upfield scholar. I've uh, travelled for nearly uh, 20 weeks, been away from the farm for 20 weeks this last year. I've seen, been to 11 countries and the first um, part of my trip was a global focus trip with these guys here. There's a dairy farmer, there's a kiwi, a couple of sheep guys, and a few arable, a few croppers as well. So I'd like to thank Nuffield for the opportunity that they gave me for the last 12 months, and especially JADC for their support. But the Nuffield network is an amazing network of farmers right around the world, and it's the, the people that were part of the network that made Nuffield experience quite amazing. My Nuffield journey took me to many places. Marty's from Innesvale in uh, northern Queensland. He's had nearly four metres of rain for the last four months. And this is the first time he saw snow. Part of my journey, I went to uh, Mexico, to the pyramids, Chicago. Went to Obregong in Mexico City and saw cement. Uh, we saw coffee production, sugar cane, and processing plants. And even went spent a week at a conference with uh, the other Nuffield scholars from around the world. So it was truly an amazing experience and one I recommend to any young farmer wanting to get out there and be part of agriculture. You also noticed we went on a beer tasting expedition around the world too, so that was quite an experience. Just briefly, a little bit about my background. I'm from a family farm. I farm with my wife, <coughs> Heidi, and my two brothers and uh, mum and dad as well. So we own land as individuals and then we bring it together to farm it as one, as one unit. And we do this to maximise our efficiencies uh, of labour and skills, as well as our machinery. We have a CTF, we have a controlled traffic farming system. We grow wheat, barley and canola. And we plant 5,000 hectares annually with one machine. We retain all our crop residue by inter row seeding. And I'm the principal spray operator for our business and that's what sort of led me to my, uh, to my topic. So my goals were to try and apply pesticides better. Over the years we've improved our spraying application after I went to a uh, ISGB course some seven or eight years ago. But there's still ways to improve. We've changed using coarse droplets and that's made a big difference with our spraying. But there's still more I think we can do. We've got to understand each job that we do and apply the right water rate and the right size droplet for each job. I also want to look at the impact on the environment and reduce the impact of the environment because I want pesticides that I use where they are needed. And I thought, I think it's critical that that's what happens. We want, to, we want to get the target. We don't want it to hit the plant and run off. 
The other aim of my study was to look at the regulation in the UU and see what impact it was having on farmers. And also look at the buffer zones and the drift reduction scheme, which is essentially what's coming here to Australia. But the drift reduction scheme gives value to those farmers that uptake the better technology. My study wasn't a scientific review, although it is very scientific spraying. It deals with plant biology, so plant structures, and understanding the surface of plants so we can get the droplet to be retained by the plant. It also involves chemistry and how and what happens in the tank when you mix up the uh, spray solution. And then there's engineering and physics about how the droplets are um, sprayed and how they're retained by the plant. But it's more about bringing the information together so we can do better, do, apply and do the job better each time we go out and do something. Spray application is quite a complex subject. It's researched all over the world and the information out there is quite mind-blowing. And the problem is that there's often conflicting opinions and ideas. And that makes it challenging. So as an op spray operator, I, go to the, I get recommended to use a nozzle or a certain nozzle to produce a certain droplet size. So I go to the, down the road to the machinery dealer to buy the right nozzle that I was told to buy and the machinery dealer goes, well, what do you want to use that nozzle for? So it is quite uh, conflicting at times and challenging and we don't know where the right answer is a lot of the time. Spraying is not just a grains industry problem. It involves parks and gardens and local councils, viticulture and horticulture. So I think there needs to be more an integrated approach throughout agriculture to make sure that we're all doing the right job and all doing the same research with the same outcomes and goals. On my individual study, I went, through, went to England and Ireland, I went to Germany, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, Canada and the US. And I saw some researchers. Uh, this is the uh, wind tunnel at Silso in the UK where they do the testing of the nozzles. I went to other research places in uh, Germany at JKI, uh, in Denmark, I went to Haas University, and also in Belgium, I went to Ilvelo, and also at uh, Ohio State University and Lacombe Research in Canada. I went and saw machinery dealers and manufacturers. Uh, Devano was one of those. I also went to Hardy in Denmark. And I saw some farmers and spray operators as well. One farmer I went to was in Ireland. This is my mate Kev and his wife. And I stay with Kev. He's a Nuffield Scholar from Ireland and also the Syngenta Spray of the Year um, winner as well. So he's passionate about his spraying as well. And this is a view. And this is a view from his house. So as you can see, he's got a bit of a challenge when it comes to spraying next to this field next to his house. So I just wanted to show you what he does to manage his drift. And uh, and what he does in his situation. So just, yeah, just before I go on, he does leave a one metre buffer along this edge. But he said to me, he would spray that, that field with the wind blowing onto his house. Which I couldn't believe, but this is what he does. He would do it. His kids might be playing in the, in the playground there, but um, he said he would spray that paddock with the wind blowing onto this house. So the day I was there, we went out and uh, played around with his Hardy Twin Air uh, crop, uh, field crop sprayer. And so we can see a visual, quite a visual difference with the air off, so no air, and the air on. So the air assistance is actually driving the, uh, the droplets into the canopy. And one impression I had before we went out, I thought that the air would drive those droplets to the ground. So we set up some water sensitive paper to see where the droplets were going to end up. And the interesting thing was that there was no more droplets on the ground, so actually there was more on the leaf. And for this type of spraying, which he would typically do a fungicide spraying this, at, this, at this time, he wanted the chemical on the leaf. So this machine is doing the right job for him. But it's a little bit different, this machine. It's using, um, he uses XR03 and 04 nozzles which I think can really banned in Australia. 
and he's using an 03 and 04 nozzle, driving at 8 to 12 kilometres an hour, applying 150 to up to 300 litres per hectare. So it's quite different to Australia. I don't think this is a machine for broadacre agriculture, but it's certainly got a place in some parts of Australia where there's dense canopies, a high, higher humidity, and different things like that. In the EU, regulation is having a huge impact on the choice of pesticides that farmers can use. So the assessment of pesticides has gone from a from a risk-based assessment, like we have in Australia, to a hazard base. And the graph is just, the graph is just demonstrating uh, when that started to occur. So the, risk, the assessment is meaning that if it's hazardous, so it's, whether it's mutagenic or a carcinogen or an organic uh, pollutant, they will be banned. It doesn't take into consideration the risk and, and, and knowing that risk. And so the impact on onto growers is that there's more expensive chemicals because the new chemistry coming out is more expensive. There's more research done to substantiate the claims. And so there's less choice and it's creating more, more, uh, more tillage because more tillage is needed to control weeds. Unfortunately, the impact of mismanagement of application here in Australia, we may see the same thing happen. So we may start to lose products or more so, we might be restricted in how we can use them. As I travel around, I saw plenty of equipment. But the key message I wanted to get out of this slide was, it doesn't really matter how expensive the machine is, the key is going to be the, no the nozzle that you use and the knowledge that the operator has, knowledge of the risks, uh, the knowledge about how well to set up that equipment and knowledge of the weather so we can apply pesticides right. And following on from that, I went to the biggest arable field day in the UK called Cereals. And they have a sprays and spray demonstration. It's a bit like any field days without all the side shows. Uh, and with a lot more demonstrations. And this, these photos here just demonstrate the type of spray quality produced by two beautiful brand new I don't know, $400,000 machines. That's quite clear, the spray quality with the two different types. Well, the two the machines are the same. So which one is doing the best job? Spray testing schemes operate throughout, uh, throughout Europe and the UK. They're in places like Belgium and Netherlands, France and Germany and the UK. And the purpose of the uh, spray inspection scheme is to ensure that they are working correctly, to make sure there's no leaks, to make sure they're safe, and also to reduce contamination through finding any leaks and problems with sprayers. So they test for uh, nozzle flow to determine whether all the nozzles are working correctly. Uh, if they don't test for nozzle flow, they'll test for nozzle distribution. And this thing here is a patinator for testing the distribution of nozzles. Obviously they test for safety, uh, gauge accuracy, and a number of other functions, agitation. Um, so they go through, it's just like a car registration check that they use um, to ensure sprays are working correctly. I'm not sure the full value, it does add cost to the growers uh, over there. Uh, but I think the real value is linking a spray testing scheme with the knowledge, giving the operator the right knowledge to operate his machine and that's where the best value will, will come. The operator is the, the one in control of his machine and he's got to know how to set it up. So linking the testing and the knowledge of that, and the right knowledge and the setup of that machine is the most essential, essential thing. Sprays around the, spray operators around the world are demanding faster speeds. So when I spoke to spray operators in the UK, they were driving eight kilometres an hour five years ago, now they're pushing 12, to 15 kilometres. And the same in Australia, we're going from 18, pushing 22, 25, and 30 kilometres in some cases. Tank size is getting bigger and boom widths is getting, getting wider. Even in Belgium there was a tank, a, a boom bead made that was 44 metres wide. And some of the fields are only two to five hectares. They're all, 
People are wanting to reduce water rates just to get gain more efficiencies so they can do their job more efficient. And operators also demand reliable and consistent information. But the impact of all these changes of going faster, wider booms, it's having an impact on, on drift and spray quality. And you would have heard this about this yesterday from Bill Gordon, but obviously the higher boom, the more drift, the more chance for drift. So I just want to demonstrate a solution here to that problem, is just having a gauge, which is 50 centimetres long, so you can run that at the height of the stubble, um, so you can set the right height. And the other solution is the automatic uh, height control gauges that are in place and being fitted to the boom sprays now. The impact of large tank sizes is uh, impacting on mixing and agitation and the key is trying to keep this, the solution in suspension. So you've got to have the right type of uh, agitation to, to be able to achieve that and the right capacity of the pump. And the photo in the background for those spray operators out of here may have seen some of those uh, seen, the, seen those lines occur, and that's from cleaning out or charging up your boom lines. I think there needs to be, our boom sprays need to have something to eliminate this, to make uh, charge up time quicker, and we need a recirculatory system, and a lot of the sprays in, uh, throughout Europe had a circulatory system where there was a continuous flow of chemical through the boom lines. So when they went to the field, as soon as they turned the, um, the on switch on, chemical was at the nozzle straight away. And that would make it faster for, for cleaning out as well. Instant on off is going to be important for um, automatic uh, boom section controls and to stop dripping uh, and leaking and over and over spraying. And a big thing in Europe was actually the disposal of, of the wastewater that's left over in the tank when you finish a particular job and you're changing over to another another type of chemical. And so what they've developed in, uh, in Belgium and, and Denmark is a cleaning system which is called the continuous flow system. And effectively it's got another, uh, another pump on it. And it's got low, they put low flow tank rinse nozzles on it. And so what happens, they turn the switch on, it activates the pump of the clean water, and then it flows through the tank rinse nozzle into the, sp into the spray tank while you're driving and so it's continually cleaning the line as, they, as he's spraying the paddock. So when he's finished spraying, he turns the tap on, cleans the water, and then at the end, after he's finished his clean water tank, there's less than 1% concentration of solution left in his spray tank. So he can naturally dispose of that on the ground anywhere he likes. So leading on from that, minimising water contamination is a very big issue and a big priority for them over in, in Europe. And so I just want to demonstrate some of the things that they're doing over there um, to achieve that. So they've got purpose-built filling stations so they contain all the spills and the wash down water that they use. They have these little trays to catch any water when they take the hose off or undo filters. And this is my mate in uh, Ireland, what he does, and they all, they all tend to do it. They drain their, they clean their, their, their chemical drums and let them drain. And they'll clean all the lids too and have the lids in a separate drum and a separate pile. Then they can use that water that's drained out for a spraying application job down the track. Other ways of containing and breaking down the wastewater, one I saw in Belgium was using a chemical process and it's called the Sentinel. And so it just uses um, different acids to flocculate the, the organic material, the pesticides, and so the pesticides will settle out into a slurry solution for disposal at a proper site, and the water left over is then used for the next spraying job. And the other way of breaking down wastewater is through a biobed system. And it was the first I'd seen of these when I went to Europe. There's none of them operating in Australia, and only one that I know of in North America, in Canada. And so just to uh, describe what a biobed is, the purpose of the biobed is to remediate the wastewater. And it was first developed in Sweden back in the early 1990s. And the idea was that microorganisms break down pesticides, which is what they do. But this guy 
just designed a drive over pit so where he fills up his boom spray, he made a bio bed. And the bio bed is made out of 50% straw, 25% compost, and 25% soil. And so the idea is to capture all that, uh, ca capture any waste or any uh, spills. And so he would measure and fill his spray from this, from this position. So the bio bed would capture all that. And then if he had to dump any spray, um, after finishing a paddock, he would just dump it in, in the bio bed. The other type of bio bed is an offset system, like the one I saw in Belgium. And this system here catches all the water into a tank, and then he uses the pump to spray it on this bio bed, which is this bunded area underneath, and it's made up of straw and compost and soil. And so then he would spray that uh, liquid on top of that, on top of that uh, bio bed. And the benefit of that system is that it can, can manage that water better, so the bugs, the bugs aren't going into an uh, anaerobic environment. And so that, that was one way of managing the water better. Now buffer zones in, in Europe are on most chemicals. Some chemicals don't have a buffer zone because they're not toxic to water or to anything else. They're safe chemicals. But the ones that do have a buffer zone. And the drift reduction scheme, which operates in countries like uh, Belgium and Germany and France and the UK, uh, work a bit like this. They're all a little bit different, but the only the example I want to go th through is the one they use in the UK. And this is an example of a waterway which they're trying to protect. So in this situation here, a, gr a not spray operator in the UK, if he was using... Oh, I better take a step back. All nozzles in the UK are assessed for drift at Silso, the wind tunnel. And so they're going to be rated. And when they are rated, they're rated according to the reference nozzle, which is an XR03 uh, nozzle. And then a one-star nozzle is 25% drift reduction. Two-star is 50% drift reduction compared to the reference. And three stars is a 75% drift reduction. And an example of a three-star nozzle is an AI uh, 11004. And so if this guy was to go spraying, he would undertake a lee wrap assessment of that field and of that waterway. And a lee wrap assessment is a local environmental risk assessment procedure. So he determines the length or the width of his water, water course. He works out that he's using a full dose of chemical. If he had a reference spray, he would have to leave a five metre buffer. If he had a three star nozzle, such as the AI04, he would only leave a one metre buffer. And so that's a process he's got to fill out and complete before he does that, does that spraying job in that particular paddock. But as you can see, if they're using low dose rate and the water course is wider, most buffer zones tend to be down to one metre. The example below is an example, it follows the same principles but it's just the Belgian way of doing it. Now the next few slides I just want to go through are some of the research and emerging technology that we could use today and in the future, or hopefully in the future. Now we've all seen the green seeker, the weed seeker, but in the uh, Netherlands they're doing some work by using the weed seeker to sense variable rate. So what they're doing is the green seeker seek, um, senses the different rates of green, or the different level of green, and then applies a different rate of chemical. And it does that by using the various select nozzle bodies. And so for a low rate of chemical, it'll turn one nozzle on. For half rate, it'll turn two on. And for full rate, it will turn four on. And these various select nozzle bodies can come in a pack of 10 or whatever size you want. So it's something to look out for in the future, varying the rate according to the amount of green. I visited Ken Giles at UC Davies in California. And this is going to be commercially available quite soon. It should, be, should have been released, but it's still not there yet. But Ken found that measuring, um, using flow to detect closed nozzles was a very inaccurate way to determine whether the nozzle was clogged. But then he discovered that when liquid flowed through a nozzle, it created noise. And so he's designed a sensor that just detects noise. So when that noise changes, the nozzle's clogged. And it's as simple as that. So it's something that I think we can, we'll be using within a few years. Some other tools. 
The smart nozzle has been researched in, in the USA and it's varying the rate at, at the nozzle. So for those large boom sprays, uh, when you go around a corner, the outer edge of the boom is applying a lower rate than the inner part of the boom. And the idea of the smart nozzle is to vary the rate. So the outer boom is applying a higher rate when it goes around the corner, or the rate that it should be applying, and the rate on the inside of the boom will be cut back. So the right rate, the right rate is being applied across the whole, the whole field. The Opus Spray Twin Fluid Nozzle is simply a twin fluid nozzle. It's got great flexibility and we can use this today. And this is something where I think nozzles uh, and nozzle technology is going. It allows us greater flexibility. We can control droplet size uh, on the go. So when we're nearing, nearing buffer zones, we can change the quality of the droplets just by adjusting the air pressure. And this is something we can use today to manage our drift and reduce those buffer zones. But it's having the understanding of that droplet and how that nozzle works is the most critical thing. Some research that's probably not real practical for us, but it's happening in Denmark. And it's idea, the idea behind it is to try and reduce the use and reliance of pesticides. And so they're using laser beams to control, uh, control weeds. And it all evolved from camera detection. And it does work. However, it is impacted by the length of time of the laser beam and also the weed species. So this graph, oh, this picture here, is just showing us uh, four different types of, of weed species and the different time of the laser beam. So the one in the front here was controlled with a lower time than the one behind it. But the idea of it is controlling small weeds with a, with a laser beam uh, and it does work. But it's not for 100 hectare farms or larger, unfortunately. The single drop applicator has also been researched in, in Denmark. And the idea is to apply a single drop of glyphosate to individual plants. So again, it's using camera technology to identify the weed and apply the, the drop of chemical on the individual weed. So effectively, it's like a bubble jet printer applying a drop of chemical to each weed. So the, the ability is to use um, non-selective herbicides in a, in, a, in, a, in a crop situation, such as the picture. So it's overcoming a few of those problems and definitely reducing the, the amount of pesticides that they're using. But it, again, it's not for big farms. It's more for the intensive horticultural type of industry. Now, how are we going for time? I think I might just um, brush over these ones fairly quickly. The impact of the plant on retention. So we all know what adjuvants do, and it's matching the right adjuvant to the right leaf surface that we've got. And these photos just show uh, a droplet of water against a droplet of water plus crop oil added, and what's occurring. Because it's important to understand what's happening with that droplet and the impact of using coarser droplets. And so some other issues there that are important for, uh, important for coarse droplets is that air inclusion in coarse droplets will help retention. And surfactants will reduce the surface tension of droplets and also aid in the retention uh, of droplets to plants. And the interesting thing from uh, Harry's work, was Harry Cummelback's work, is that the higher water rates, greater than 100 litres, decreases retention with coarse droplets. So in summary, for advisors, I think the focus should be getting, should be getting the basics right. You've got to match the droplet size, so the spray quality, with the water rate that we need for that job, along with the adjuvant. And that's got to be done for each product and for each target pest that we're trying to target. And this has got to be done under the varying weather conditions that we as spray operators experience. Because it's important to link all those pieces in the puzzle. New technology such as Opti spray, twin fluid nozzles, or the weed seeking and sensing for variable rate, it's going to evolve, it's just going to happen. But we still need to know the underst and understand the fundamental principles 
of droplet delivery and retention and uptake. There are some improvements that we can make to our spray application equipment to improve efficiencies and to reduce the amount of wastewater that we dispose of. And there's probably a need for us to research uh, the impact and the use of biobeds in Australia so we can reduce the impact of wastewater on our groundwater. But in the end, it's all about our willingness to learn and understand all the principles of a very complex subject. I'd like to thank Nuffield and the GRDC again for their support for my Nuffield scholarship and also my family back home. Wayne McGuire, Dave, thanks very much for your talk. Um, what the talk did trigger to me was we need a lot more of that information on retention work. I noticed the 250 micron size as being where we start to lose the retention unless we're using the right adjuvants and we seem to be very efficient in all that data in Australia. Maybe you can suggest either what we do about getting better training or where we go for that information. Well, I think it's not just the grains industry problem, and I think um, white agriculture industry has got the same problem, the same issues. So perhaps we need something bigger than just the grains industry focusing on droplet delivery and retention and understanding plant biology better so we can understand how to manage that droplet. So maybe it's big picture stuff and it's got to incorporate all of agriculture.